working on a memoir. It's a true thing. What I started can you even tell telling us people. About that? I don't know what I can tell you. It's new. It's mm -hmm. a you know, and it, here's the thing about what I know about writing. I know that what you do is you write some things and then you write some more things. And mm -hmm. I used to say you write a poem and then you write another poem and then you write another poem and then you write another poem. And even when you're writing a project book, it's really important to do that. Because if you're writing a project, then you start to feel it's stilted and you don't have you don't have breath and range and you can't surprise yourself. And if you can't surprise yourself, you certainly can't surprise, surprise your reader. And if I'm not surprised as a reader, I'm putting the book down. I'm too busy these days. Mm -hmm. I don't keep reading a book anymore. <laughs> so uh, what I know is that I'm writing these, I'm writing these stories now. And, and then I finished that exploration and then I think for a while, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I start writing another one. And they've started to cohese. But but I, I've stopped asking myself where things are going. Hmm. They'll present, that, that answer will present itself when it's time. That's interesting because it sounds like a real flip of your process, which is driven by a form. And now what you're saying is, I'm writing this. I'm not quite sure what the form is. Mm, or... No. Each, each little essay, the form starts to reveal itself very clearly. And so the form and the, 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 the engagement, I, um, and each of them is really kind of unique in, in how I'm using form to help convey subject and... and yeah, you know, and by form, there's all kinds of things I could say. I just, I, I'm, I'm just completing uh, uh, the revision of one that is written almost entirely in present tense, mm. and there's a conscious formal reason for that, right? And it became very clear early on, about by page four, that I had to go back and take out all the past tense and write it in the now, and and that that it's difficult actually to write a whole. 20 page essay in <laughs> present tense and so that became part of the struggle of the of the essay was how to make that work what i'm saying when i say i don't know where it's going is i don't necessarily know how that essay fits with the other essay which is all in the second person which fits in another like i don't know what the book is going to look like i see but i know i do know that it it's going to be something and so that's what i've stopped judging you know i you know i have a daughter now and I don't know what she's gonna look like. <laughs> I don't know who she's gonna be. I know, I hope, that she's gonna be a grown woman. And I know that there's things that I can do to help guide that into the best possible conclusion. But I don't know what the final outcome is gonna be. And, and that's okay with me now. I've written enough that I feel that the stress that I had when I was writing my first two books where I, I needed to sort of jump forward into the future and predict what the future was going to look like. I don't, no need, I can enjoy the now. Mm -hmm. I can enjoy the present. Um, well, you just brought up the present and I'm going to now ask you about the past. Um, last night at your reading, you mentioned that you took your first trip to Ghana, was it 15 years ago? 10. 10 years ago and you visited the slave castles and it's only been very recently that you've been able to write about that experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're writing with regards to, to that subject? That's the essay that's all in the present tense. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think why the essay had to be all in the present tense is because when I first went to Ghana in 2003 and I came home and I tried to write poems about it, uh, the poems were, this thing happened once. How awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know this thing happened once and we know it was awful. And those of us who know these stories now know the stories that you hear as you walk through those castles. And they're horrific and they're, they're stirring and terrifying and they don't go away, right? But, they, but the thing that's, that's terrifying about them is that they don't go away because they're really happening in the present tense. Mm. 
They happened then, but they're happening now. The residue of what's happening is now, is right now. It doesn't end. And I wrote Suck on the Marrow, really. I, I think Suck on the Marrow was deeply influenced by having been at Cape Coast Castle and Elmina Castle. And there's one poem in the anthology that came out of out of that, or in the anthology, in the book, mm -hmm. that came out of that experience, but, but is now captured in this 19th century text, right? And so it doesn't, it's not, I, I, don't, have a tr I don't have trouble moving things around in the time-space continuum. Like, I originally wrote it to be this period, and now it goes back to something else. You know, there's, a, there's a poem in my first book called Ark that was, was a love poem in the now to whoever I was with at the time. And, and then it goes into the book, and it's in the little little mini story about my grandparents, and that's just fine. I can give them that love poem. You know, mm -hmm. I don't I don't have any trouble. Uh, but so I think that what changed was my ability to realize, maybe not to realize, maybe I already realized it, but to articulate the complexity of history requires us to to attach with it in the present tense. Hmm. Otherwise, we can shut it out. And it doesn't have to do with us. We don't have to do anything to change it. We're not personally responsible. We're not culpable. It's something that happened then, and what can we do with it? And then it's done, you know? Then it's over, and nothing changes. Last night at the reading, you were talking about how part of the function of a poet is to not only be a witness, but to transform what you've witnessed uh, so that it goes beyond mere reporting. Um, and I was kind of interested to hear more about that process of transformation. That's art. That's art, is that process of transformation. Because of some of the things that I'm saying, what, what we want to do is, is stop things that make us vulnerable. That's, that's normal. It makes a lot of sense. Vulnerability is dangerous. And so when things are presented in a, in a pat manner that's, that we've heard if things aren't made to feel deeply personal and deeply resonant for us, and if there's not some form of beauty, and I'm not talking about the dappled sunlight kind of beauty, I'm not talking about some sort of gentle breeze beauty, I'm, I might be talking about sound, I might be talking about The way the the poems look on the line on, on the page, the the way it's it's scattered or condensed, and and the way that the physical object represents something that we recognize, which is part of how we get into that pre-literal understanding of something. I just see something and I feel something with a bunch of gaps and spaces on the page that is different than a straight column block down the page, right? That if we don't have this really physical and um, back of the brain, brainstem reaction to something, we can tune it out. We can say that is not a vulnerability that needs to affect me. And so as a poet, we need to worm our way into the, into the, the, the brainstem of the reader and so that it's, it gets them before they're able to tune it out. 